which was equipping churches with a ministry to work with seniors as they get older and have another problem. I think you're going to love what he has to say. He's an exciting speaker. And I'm going to cut this off and turn you over. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I just want to know if anyone had way too much food to eat and you're going to fall away and fall off because I will pick on you incessantly. You identify yourself that way. Uh, my name is uh, Reverend Mike McMenamin. I have the distinct pleasure of speaking with you today, and I really mean that because I've been listening to all of your introductions. Please don't ask me to remember everybody's name, uh, but it's a pleasure because I was a little wary. You know how it is when you've never been someplace and then they ask you to speak, and you know, Russell's representing you, so you have your doubts, and. <laughs> and um, but you say yes because you just met the guy and you met him that day and he goes, hey, would you come speak at our group? And it was almost a little air of desperation, you know? And you're like, oh, no, it's one of those groups, you know? They can't get anybody to come and you don't really know what to expect. And, no, and then your day... What's that? Well, I know, I know. We can blame you. Um, everybody knows Lucy. She's the only one in the room that didn't introduce herself. Um, she's so shy. Um, but uh, I, have, I, I do have the distinct, distinct pleasure of sharing with you today, but I also arrive in, in a little bit different place maybe than some of you, with the exception of Rachel, I think I'm, and maybe Monica, I'm probably the youngest person in the room. Uh, I'm 50, by the way, and I tell people that because I like it when you say, really? So I like that, so uh, I'll take that, right? How many of you will take that? Some of the you're younger than you really are, right? So male or female, you'll take it, right? So I want to start with a couple of questions, and uh, these questions are a little weird, a little unusual, but I'm going to ask for your, at least your physical involvement, raise a hand, wave at me, wink, something, as we ask these questions, but they will make sense when I'm done, okay? Is that fair? Yeah. Okay, good. First question, uh, how many here brushed your teeth sometime in the last 48 hours? <laughs> so I'd like to ask one hand, everyone get their hand up too, okay, right, we get started. I want you to think about the last time you brushed your teeth, whether that was this morning or last night or whatever, and you took your toothbrush from the normal storage location, wherever you normally keep it. How many of you go straight for the water, that's the first thing you do, is you get wet? Yeah. 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 Okay. How many go straight for the paste? You just grab that sucker and throw the paste on it, right? And, and your name again? Mary? Mary. Mary? Okay, you're Mary. You're what we call a dry paster. <laughs> <laughs> That's the American we love paste, right? So for those of you who get water, the paste is next, right? How many go back for more water? Okay, and let's see, it's, uh, it's raining, right? You're what we call a greedy double dipper. Okay. Now, once you have your toothbrush with the paste on, it's all wet, and then you go to brush your teeth, right? How many start on the top? How many start on the bottom? How many start with your teeth together? How many right now have absolutely no idea how you brush your own teeth? Are you sitting there scratching yourself? In there? How many start in your hand? <laughs> you know, the denture's going on, right? So, okay. so sometimes I have to explain that one. Okay, now, second, second set of questions. Um, for those of you who put on a shirt or a coat or a blouse every day, which thankfully is all of you, um, how many are left arm first people? The left arm goes in that sucker first. Okay. How many are right arm first people? How many right now have really no idea how you actually got dressed? I see some of your feet, you're going. I had one guy tell me, he says, I don't know how I get dressed in the dark because my wife's still sleeping. So apparently, hopefully, he puts his pants on the right way every morning. Right? Um, now, when you're putting on your shoes and your socks, how many are sock, sock? Shoe, shoe. Sock, sock. Shoe. Anyone sock, shoe, sock, shoe? <laughs> okay. I don't know if we have the of the Asian variety today, but, uh, oh, Rachel, yes. You do go to Auden, so. So here's the idea, okay? It sounds kind of silly to ask all these questions, but there's actually a point behind them. 
okay? Many of us in this room are dealing with some type of respiratory ailment, obviously. That's why we're here. How many found that when your problem began to develop, there were certain things you couldn't do anymore? And you kind of had to relearn how to do some things that you used to do. You know what I'm talking about, right? This topic is going to hit you guys right where you live. Okay? So I want to draw a little picture here real quick. Now, I'm not a medical doctor, okay? Uh, in fact, I'm one of the most medically ignorant people you'll ever meet. I'm just telling you right now. Okay, I'm not a medical doctor. Um, I had you have something going against me. I'm a pastor. Mike? Yes. Which hand are you going to use first? <laughs> Which what? Which hand are you going to use first? Which hand am I going to use first? I only draw with my right because I respect you. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm a pastor. And so as a pastor, I'm usually called in, you know, when the crisis happens, right? When somebody has an issue, when somebody falls down, when somebody gets carted off to the hospital, you know, you call the ambulance first and the pastor second. Please make sure you do that in that order. Okay, call the ambulance first and then the pastor, okay? Because um, I don't know anything about medicine. I'm just, I'm not a medical guy. So I'm not going to talk to you about medical-related stuff today. Uh, I am, however, second youngest of 11 children. So I am diseased. Okay, uh, and that'll come true by the time we're done. You'll understand that. Um, I'm also an insurance agent. I'm not going to sell you anything. You can relax. I saw that flash. Close your eyes. Okay. But what's interesting about that combination of being a pastor and an insurance agent is, as a pastor, I usually arrive after it's too late to do any to do much planning. And as an insurance agent, what I try to do is speak with people about planning before it's too late. And so I'm in a unique position to see both sides of this dilemma we call the end of life. And this journey that we are all on from the moment we are born, we are all on the same journey. Interesting enough, we're all together in the journey, but most of us don't even think about it most of our lives. Would you agree? Right? Now, I'm fortunate in that I've almost died seven different times. So I am literally a walking miracle. I fell 25 feet out of a tree when I was a kid. Landed flat on my back in the mud. You ever do those snow angels, you know? I did a mud angel. Okay, landed in the mud next to the stream, and that absorbed my fall. Okay? I was buried alive when I was 14 years old, and me and David Addison were digging in the dirt in the, behind our house, and we dug a nice little six-foot-in tunnel on this side and a six-foot-in tunnel. Both of us, head first, scratching the earth until our hands met, made the hole bigger, and then I was dumb enough to let him, the bigger guy, go first. So he went in and went all the way through, and I went in all the way through, only I didn't make it all the way out because the whole thing collapsed in on it. <laughs> And there was a, car a cartoon I saw years ago where somebody's arms were sticking through the wall like this, waving. That was me. And he grabbed me and pulled me in. Okay? Now I'm going to share a story with you today um, about when I almost died due to alcohol. I'm going to share that story with you. Um, I also uh, hit two deer traveling at 75 miles an hour. Actually, the deer weren't traveling at 75 miles an hour. I was the guy in the car traveling at 75 miles an hour. And uh, either of those incidents can take your life, right? Um, Rich was here earlier. He was telling me he has a background in electricity and electrical design and engineering and stuff. And uh, I actually blew a 30-amp fuse when I was in the Navy. For any of you who know, that's 300 times the current necessary to take your life. And I survived. It was a 450 volt three phase AC electrical system, two o'clock in the morning on a submarine. Mm -hmm. That time I was up here and my body was down there. Mm -hmm. Watch. Mm -hmm. As the way I look at it, my soul decided whether or not I was going to stay here or not. <clears throat> and I came back. Um, that's a long period of time, by the way. It doesn't seem like it, but it was that quick, but it was a long time. And there's a few others along the way that we'll talk about. But all of those experiences got me thinking about the way I was living my life. How many, when you got diagnosed, you kind of started to stop and think. 
about the way you were living your life. How many know exactly what I'm talking about? Right? So because I'm kind of weird, um, I came up with a way of kind of looking at the way I was living my life, which I don't know if it'll make sense to you or not. Um, that's my pathetic attempt to diagnose, uh, to diagram an iceberg. How many here have ever seen an iceberg live and in person? Okay, who has not? Okay, have you ever seen an ice cube? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you've probably seen an ice cube, right? They all work in the same way when you dump them in water, don't they? What do they do? They float, don't they, right? But do they float all the way below the surface of the water? Do they float out of the water? Or do they float something kind of a little bit of both? How much of an iceberg or an ice cube when you float it is above the surface of the water? The tip. The tip. That's a good medical, I mean, uh, mathematical description. <laughs> Thank you. How about percentages? How much of an iceberg is out of the surface of the water? One fourth. That's the number one wrong answer. Everybody says it's one fourth. Okay. Ten percent. That's also the second most popular wrong answer. But that's closer. I um, think it's all out, except for the very. So only this much is in the water. Just the tip. No. Actually, it runs just about like this. In fact, if you, if you do the math, it's one ninth is above the surface of the water. One ninth. One ninth. And eight ninths is below the surface. Now, if you want percentages, that's 12% is above the surface of the water. And if you do your math, quick, anyone do the math? Thank you. 88% is below the surface of the water. <laughs> now you're wondering why in the world are we talking about icebergs? Well, here it comes. You can wake up. <laughs> I discovered through just a lot of research and a lot of my own life and a lot of introspection. How many of you look back on your life and go, gee, has it been good? Have I done some good things? How many have done some good things in your life? I hope you, everyone can raise their hand to that one, right? Because you're still here. Okay? And if you've never done a good thing, there's the door. <laughs> so, you know... But here's what I figured out. I figured out that the iceberg can be used as an analogy for the way our mind works. That above the surface of the water, I refer to as the conscious mind. I'm going to define these. And below the surface is what we refer to as the subconscious. Now, again, I started with some strange questions about how you brush your teeth, how you put your clothes on, how you put your shoes on. Those are all things we just kind of do. No, I said like some of you didn't know how you did them, even though you do them every day. Right? You're like, I don't know how I do that. I just wake up and suddenly I'm dressed. I just wake up and suddenly I'm done in the bathroom. Right? But for those of you that are dealing with medical issues that have impacted your ability to do things, you're living this, whether you realize it or not. Because as your disease progresses, you begin to realize there are things you just can't do anymore, or you have to start doing things you used to do all the time a little differently than you used to do them before. And you run into some problems when you do that, don't you? Because all of a sudden, you have to start, I just can't run downstairs and get the things <coughs> out of the car. I have to stop, think, plan, and ask myself, is there anything else I can do when I'm down there? That's true. Isn't that true? Right? Jeannie Robertson, who's a professional speaker and a former Miss America, said, when I hit 65, she realized that before I bend over, I have to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in 2006, I spent um, about seven months in tremendous amounts of pain when I herniated two discs in my back, one of the top.